Happy New Year, everyone. My name is Barb Spurrier. I'm the Administrative Director of the Center for Innovation, or the CFI, as it is known. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our CFI series of Unexpected Conversations. This is a new speaker series that we launched in the fall of 2011. Tim Brown, who is the CEO of IDEO and serves on our CFI External Advisory Council, was our first speaker. We hold this series on a quarterly basis, bringing world-renowned experts from various disciplines and fields to Mayo Clinic. As part of the experience for the external speaker, we actually identify part of our organization that they'd like to learn more about, and we create an immersive opportunity for the speaker. So for our speaker today, Sarah Miller Caldecutt, she had an opportunity to spend time with our Division of Engineering, with Kevin Bennett, with April Horn, and the engineering team. And I know she found that to be so interesting and exciting. This speaker series brings the energy and diversity of our signature Transform event. We hold that every year in September, an annual event. And it keeps the whole innovation conversation going throughout the year. All of our talks are webcast and available to you via our CFI website. So for colleagues who couldn't be here today, thank you for sharing that there are other opportunities for them to connect with this talk or any of the Transform or upcoming series of Unexpected Conversation talks. Maybe just by a show of hands, how many have participated in our Transform Symposium? Okay, so that's great. Um, so uh, on with the show in an introduction of our speaker uh, for today, Sarah, Milder, Sarah Milder, Miller Caldecutt. Uh, Sarah is a great grandniece of Thomas Edison. She's been engaged in creativity and innovation throughout her life. Inspired by a family lineage of inventors dating back five generations, Sarah began her 25-year career as a marketing executive with major brand firms, including Quaker Oats and the Unilever uh, organization. Sarah was very concerned that America was losing its innovation leadership, and she spent three years researching Edison's innovation methods with experts at Rutgers University. She co-authored the first book ever written on the subject of Edison's world-changing innovation methods. This is entitled, entitled Innovate Like Edison, and the book has been translated into five languages. And it actually serves as a textbook for many undergrad and graduate programs around the country and the world. Sarah is an award-winning speaker. She's traveled around the world inspiring audiences on how they can employ Edison's timeless innovation methods to their organizations. <laughs> She's also a selected speaker for the popular TEDx series. Her most recent speech was captured in an ebook that she authored entitled, Inventing the Future, What Would Thomas Edison Be Doing Today? Dedicated to revitalizing America's global innovation leadership, she also serves on the steering committee of the Edison Awards. Innovate Like Edison has been featured in the New York Times, Fortune Magazine, USA Today, Sarah has appeared as an innovation expert on PBS, CNBC, the Fox Network, and National Public Radio. She is president of her own Chicago-based consulting firm called the Power Patterns of Innovation, which offers organizations training and guidance on how to achieve innovation and success in this new world order. She holds a BA from Wellesley and an MBA from the Amos Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth. She will be talking today about innovation and collaboration. So just in terms of the format, Sarah will speak for about 30 minutes, and then we're saving 30 minutes for your terrific questions. We have three people around the room with roaming mics to go ahead and ask you to speak into the microphone with your question. Uh, Sarah has also agreed to stay past 1 o'clock, which is the official ending time. She'll stay actually here until 1.30 if you want to approach her with any comments or more specific questions. So thank you for coming to our CFI series of Unexpected Conversations, and please join me in welcoming Sarah.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Barb, and thanks to your entire team for the opportunity to be with all of you today. Also, thank you to Kevin and April for the wonderful tour that I got and description of what happens in the Department of Engineering here. It's really stuff that Edison would love. He would just relish uh, the laboratory work and all of the collaborative work that you do that brings innovation to Mayo and outside the walls of Mayo. I'm so thrilled to talk about some of Edison's processes and methods with you today and reveal a little bit of what I learned about Edison's innovation methods in the research that Barb mentioned, which I did at Rutgers. I'm also in the process of writing another book on Edison, which will be coming out this fall on collaboration. So I will touch on some of the key themes from that book, and perhaps we can as well uh, go into further detail on that in our question and answer session. So let's begin by looking at some of the most extraordinary and unexpected conversations that Edison generated in his lifetime. Unexpected conversations that actually continue into the present day. $6.7 billion. How many of you think that's a lot of money? OK, most of you. A couple of you holding out for a little more. That's all right. $6.7 billion is the estimated market value of the patents and industries that Edison had established as of 1910. That marked roughly the first 40 years of Edison's career. Anybody want to venture a guess as to what that $6.7 billion would be worth today? Over 100 billion dollars. And Edison went on yet for another 20 years to continue his inventing and work in innovation. If we look at all the patents and all of the industries that Edison developed, and we look at the ripple effects of those creations into the present day on a global basis, the market value would exceed one trillion dollars. So Edison has a great deal to teach us about value creation, about innovation, creating new markets, and thinking differently. Here are a few images of Edison, starting with one of my favorite in the upper left here. This is Edison roughly at the age of 12. It's funny because I never think of Edison as having been young. Right? He was always an older man as I brought him to my thoughts, very similar to the image that you see in the lower right, which is one of the most famous images of Edison. It was taken a few years before his death. But this extraordinary man lived in a very unique era of our history. He was born in 1847 before the Civil War and died during the Great Depression in 1931 at the age of 84. His last pa patent was actually granted posthumously. This is an image of my great-great-grandfather, also an inventor, Lewis Miller. He had 92 patents and 11 children. So he was a very busy guy. <laughs> my great-grandfather was the fifth child. And the seventh child, you see in the middle frame here, Mina Miller. She married Thomas Edison in 1886 when she was 20 years old, two years after the death of Edison's first wife, who passed away, leaving Edison with their three children. Imagine that you were 20 years old and had a 14-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 10-year-old. Life would have been a little different, yes? But this is what Mina signed up for. She became a stepmother to Edison's three children and then went on to have three more children with Edison. So he had six children by the time he died in 1931. Edison was 39 when Mina married him. He was already a world famous inventor. So she had the opportunity to live the life of a celebrity with all its pros and cons. In the upper right is a picture of my grandfather, Robert Anderson Miller, 
who worked at Pittsburgh Plate Glass and invented shatterproof glass, or Herculite glass. I actually had a chance to see some of the work that Mayo does with glass today. So it was absolutely fascinating to grow up in this mindset of invention and creativity, what it takes to have the courage and the persistence to be an inventor, to consistently innovate over time, despite economic difficulties, despite business challenges, despite having to sell patents when you don't want to have to sell them, you wish that you could keep them and develop them. But the world of the inventor and the innovator is a highly unique one. I had such an under, an, a unique opportunity to understand more about Edison's life as I did my research at Rutgers, looking into what it was that made him so successful. Over 70 books had been written about Edison, but only a handful had been written by business people who want to understand how he actually became such a prolific innovator. This is what Innovate Like Edison looks at really for the first time. What are the methods and the processes? What are the sequences and the patterns that we can look at today that Edison used over and over again? Innovate Like Edison came out in 2007. I had the opportunity to work on the book with my co-author, Michael Gelb. He's an expert on genius thinking. I also had a chance to recently release an ebook called Inventing the Future. This is what Barb just mentioned. I had a chance to do a TED Talk back in November. So this ebook actually went along with the TED Talk. And I encourage you, any of you who are particularly interested in looking at how Edison envisioned the future, to have a look at this. I promise there are no more links in the rest of my presentation. This is a long set of links here. But really, it was stimulating to think about what did Edison see as he looked ahead? What techniques did he use to think about what was possible? The Department of Engineering looks ahead 20 years. And Edison easily looked ahead 20 years and sometimes more. He even made forecasts for his investors that went out 20 years. So a very interesting kind of mental frame that he had. Some of the most unique and unexpected conversations that Edison created came from this facility, the world's first research and development laboratory, which we call the Menlo Park Lab. I know that my sixth grade social studies teacher never mentioned that Thomas Edison actually invented R&D. How many of you knew that Edison was the father of research and development? OK, just a handful of you. This is really not something that we talk much about. And yet, research and development, if Edison had done, done nothing else, would put Edison in the history books. Because for the first time, we had a way to go from idea all the way out to commercialization in any industry. Edison showed us how to create profit from science and technology. And not only was he able to build extraordinary laboratories and facilities, he was able to teach his employees how to think like innovators, how to experiment, how to collaborate. And we'll talk more about that as we proceed here this afternoon. Among the most fascinating things I learned about Edison as a leader was that he only had about three months of traditional schooling. Edison was actually homeschooled. He never graduated from college. He developed, however, a love of learning that was absolutely insatiable. In his second laboratory, the West Orange Laboratory in West Orange, New Jersey, he actually had a three-story office, which housed 10,000 books. In 1887, when the laboratory was built, that actually made the library one of the top five largest libraries in the world. Imagine working for someone like that. You could go into the library, check out a book on the honor system, read in any area of endeavor, science, math, physics, the proceedings of the Royal Academy, the classics, and science fiction. 
Edison loved science fiction. This was part of how he envisioned the future, part of how he saw new worlds and new needs. As a leader, he established over 150 companies in his lifetime and had thousands of employees across the world. One of the most famous companies which exists to this day in Edison's time was the Edison General Electric Company. This was the first organization that actually made lamps and the system of electrical power. J.P. Morgan, who was one of Edison's investors, actually stripped the Edison name from the Edison General Electric Company. It didn't make him very happy. It then became called the General Electric Company, or GE as we know it today. So portions of this building that you see actually still exist. But one of the top most innovative companies in the world, we can trace back to Thomas Edison himself. Some of you may read Science Magazine as part of your work here at Mayo. Edison established Science Magazine in 1880, and he funded the very first year of its publishing. So this publication exists to this day. It was actually designed to compete with a publication from the UK called Nature, which also still exists to this day. So Edison wanted to have a forum for discussion. He wanted unexpected conversations to be yielded from this magazine. He wanted the insights that he had, as well as other scientists, to be shared to create a community of knowledge and a consistently expanding array of knowledge. This is very consistent with where Mayo operates to this day. You may also not be aware that one of Edison's inventions was the first commercially viable fluoroscope. The fluoroscope exists in the world of medicine and healthcare to this day. This is a rather unique and one of the few photos of Edison with the fluoroscope. But the fluoroscope was a portable mechanism that had various plates on it with phosphorescent chemicals that allowed physicians to actually see into the body. That was science fiction in the 1890s. Edison would marvel today at what is possible in the world of science and medicine and much of what you are doing here at, medicine, at Mayo would really, really astonish him. Part of what was unique about Edison as well in his role as a leader was his ability to set an innovation climate. Edison modeled the kinds of behaviors that he wanted to see in his employees. This is one of the most important things that leaders can do today, is to model those qualities, the mindset, the behaviors that you want to see in your employees when it comes to innovation. By doing that, Edison set up a dynamic exchange with his employees that allowed them to have input into what was going on. He didn't just dictate how things would proceed in the laboratory. He wanted it to be a collaborative environment. He was very successful in creating this. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Here is a listing of the six industries that Edison created in his lifetime. In modern times, Wayne Huizenga has established three Fortune 500 companies, which is a feat that has yet to be matched. But I think in quoting the $6.7 billion that I mentioned earlier, we can see that it has roots in really disruptive, unique, absolutely fascinating innovations, which all exist today. Document duplication, recorded sound, the phonograph and the first record. We also have, of course, the world of electrical power, the incandescent electric light, the entire system of electrical power. Telecommunications is mentioned as the carbon button transmitter, which improved upon Bell's transmitter. Alexander Graham Bell was only about 20 days shy of Edison's birthday. They were you know, extreme competitors in their lifetimes. Edison and Bell went back and forth in their inventions. Edison vested Bell on his transmitter. Motion pictures, the late 1890s, early 1900s, Edison invented the movies. 
an extraordinary new form of entertainment that captivated people's attention, allowed them to leave their homes and become part of a new community of actually watching motion pictures. And finally, the storage battery. The same guy who invented the grid, the power grid, is the person who helped us take power off the grid in the form of batteries. Being able to use batteries in farm equipment or municipal vehicles to save energy and to save time. All of these industries exist in one form or another today, which in itself is extraordinary. I'd like to walk you through what I call the five competencies of innovation. These are the patterns and sequences that I mentioned earlier, the pieces that Edison was using over and over in his innovation process. I'm just going to highlight each of these briefly. The first, kaleidoscopic thinking. <laughs> so, excuse me, the first, solution-centered mindset. The second, kaleidoscopic thinking. The third, full-spectrum engagement. The fourth, mastermind collaboration. And the fifth, super value creation. In looking at these competencies, we can see what the innovation landscape was for Edison, how big he viewed it to be, how deep he was able to go in various facets of the innovation process. Beginning with the solution-centered mindset, here is where Edison began casting himself forward in time. He began looking ahead to see what was possible. What were the array of solutions that could be considered for solving a particular problem? Edison liked to look at juicy, big problems. And he created multiple solutions that he would then ask his collaborators in the laboratory to evaluate. Today, we often start with small solution frames. A lot of times, we try to eliminate options at the very beginning. This is where Edison would disagree with much of how we proceed in the innovation realm. By looking at a broad array of solutions, Edison was actually often able to come back and look from other projects at things that he was thinking about years before. So all of his solutions created a big picture. He wasn't looking at them discreetly or in a finite way. So creating an expansive solution frame was one of Edison's hallmarks. Second, kaleidoscopic thinking. Edison liked to look at things from multiple angles. And really what was extraordinary about Edison's process is that he was using whole brain thinking. He wasn't just relying on data. He wasn't just relying on intuition. He was creating and bringing together the best of the left brain all of the organizational capabilities and analytical capabilities, and the best of the right brain, which is where our strategic mind lies, our strategic thinking, the pictures, the visuals, the images, the patterns. Kaleidoscopic thinking brings those capabilities together. Full spectrum engagement. I was shocked that a man born in 1847 was able to live 84 years, which was almost 30 years longer than the average life expectancy of a male born before the Civil War. No Prozac, no Zantac, no ATM machines, no credit cards, six kids, thousands of employees, lots of time in court, litigation, and more. How did he not have a nervous breakdown? Full spectrum engagement actually gives us a chance to see how Edison could move through conversations fluidly by navigating opposites. He could be very serious and yet very playful. He loved to look at things that were complex in nature, yet he could explain them in simple terms. And there are other opposites that Edison mastered, and he taught these facilities to his employees. So no matter what the economic environment was, Edison was able to work fluidly and without distraction. This is something I think we can really learn from Edison on, because today we spend a lot of time and energy focusing on what we don't have 
or what we wish we had, or that the economy should be better. Edison really liked to work with what was here and now and imagine how he could project it forward in a positive way. Fourth, competency of innovation, mastermind collaboration. Here is where we see Edison putting together innovation teams, very successful collaborative teams. And I'm going to go into more detail on this shortly. One of the keys to his innovation success was his ability to bring multiple disciplines together on one team. Typically very small, at least at the start, three to eight people. Edison was a collaborator throughout his career, from the very earliest times, even as a teenager, when he was inventing and building prototypes, he would work jointly with others. He realized the value of having multiple perspectives on his innovation challenges. So collaboration was hugely important to Edison over the course of his career. The fifth competency of innovation, super value creation. This is where the $6.7 billion comes in. Creating and delivering new customer value in the marketplace. It's great to have all these solutions. It's great to have these fantastic teams of people. It's wonderful to have a laboratory environment that's exciting and dynamic. But what's also needed is to connect with the market, to connect with the customer, to identify what their needs are and how his products or services could fulfill those needs. Super value creation also became a hallmark of Edison. He wasn't just inventing for inventing's sake. He was looking at needs, responding to needs, and also proactively creating new experiences for his customers. Let's go back and talk a little bit in more depth about collaboration as Edison viewed it. Because I think that there are some unique twists, unique perspectives that he brings to the world of collaboration that can prove very valuable to us today. I know that teamwork is extremely important within mail. I know it is a part of your culture. But I invite you to listen and see where there are opportunities to bring some of Edison's thinking some of the unexpected conversations Edison had around collaboration into your own conversations today. I believe that there were four phases to Edison's collaboration approach. The first phase is what I call the capability phase. It's very important for an organization to actually have some of the raw material to begin with as they collaborate or look to collaborate. And that involves these multiple disciplines that I talked about before. It's very challenging when the only folks on a team are from engineering, or the only folks on a team are from uh, the world of physics. The only folks on the team are software programmers. There must be a belief and a resonance with the idea that multiple disciplines are important and valuable. As well, part of capability comes with the size of the teams. I mentioned earlier that small teams were very much part of Edison's view in how innovation and collaboration could be most successful. Many times, organizations like to begin with big teams, begin with 20, begin with 25, begin with 50. Very, very challenging, and you'll see why as we progress through this conversation. Part of what is helpful in the small environment is the ability to communicate, the ability to change, exchange ideas rapidly. When you're in an early phase of a conversation about problem solving, having 20, 30, 50 people in the conversation right away is very challenging. Second phase of collaboration. Context. Sometimes teams are given a problem to solve, and A, they're given no context at all for which to, in which to solve it, or B, they must create a new context. Let me give you some examples. Edison was a scientist. He approached many of his problems and problem-solving uh, techniques as a scientist. 
but he was also willing to suspend some of the logic and look for things that were fantastical, fantastical solutions to problems. The, in, the incandescent electric light had never been conceived previously. There were experiments that had been done with incandescence. People and other scientists had gotten close. But Edison conceived of the vacuum and the filament. And there were other things as well. But those two things in particular drove him to be successful. He shifted the context of thinking about incandescence and how it could be possible. If we look at Edison's invention of the phonograph, I mentioned earlier Edison's back and forth struggles with Alexander Graham Bell for who is the better scientist, who is the better inventor. Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone and beat Edison. Edison invented the phonograph and beat Bell. So I guess they considered themselves even after that. But Edison invented the phonograph because he was looking at sound and acoustics in a different context than Bell was. They were both looking at it scientifically, but Bell was interested in the single transmission of sound. How do I send sound out from point A to point B? Edison wanted to send the sound out but also record it so that it could be replayed. That's how the phonograph differs in many respects from the telephone. It allows the sound to be replayed over and over again. In fact, Edison was trying to create voicemail, in essence, when he invented the phonograph. He was trying to capture a phone call and record it in case you weren't there to get it. Pretty fantastical solution, yes, for the 1870s. So context is crucially important for the collaborator to understand what are the markets, what are the options, where can I play with these ideas. Third phase of collaboration, coherence. If the team is still together after you've gone through some of phase one and phase two, it's very crucial that other forms of connection are created within the team. Most particularly, inspiration. Every successful collaborative team needs an inspirational leader. This is something that we forget about today. Edison himself was inspirational across all of his employee base. But what he was able to do was to create innovation leaders in his companies. People who were inspiring and allowing the work of innovation to proceed without him. He couldn't be everywhere. So think about how inspiration shows up in your collaborative teams. Do you have an intentional focus on creating inspirational leaders or even understanding what inspiration is and how that gets transmitted? Inspiration allows teams to stay cohesive and stay together in difficult times, when problems arise, when management says no, and you want management to say yes. Fourth phase of collaboration, complexity. Edison's organization didn't just spring up from nothing and be able to create the incandescent electric light and the system of electrical power in three years. That's how much time it took, only three years. I think that's fast even by today's standards. Over 40 patents associated with the system of electrical power and some half dozen with the incandescent electric light. Very complex work. Edison was laying the groundwork for his organization to take on complex challenges over the course of time. He was seeding these capabilities as he taught all of his employees how to experiment, as he taught them to work in small teams and to share information without a lot of social distance. People felt very collegial in Edison's laboratories. People weren't holding back information and saying, I've been here for 10 years. You've only been here for two years. I'm not going to tell you what I know. Those things didn't happen. 
So creating that level playing field in phase one and moving that all the way through allowed Edison's teams to handle a lot of difficult challenges. One of the difficulties we have today as leaders and managers is that a lot of times we want to throw people right in here. We start with complexity. We start with that big team of 50 people. You can, you can have big teams when you know how to handle complexity. Edison had dozens and dozens of people working on the first central power station in 1882. But he could not have done that successfully unless he had worked and built the capabilities in phases one, two, and three. So sometimes we see innovation failure, collaboration failure, when we push people right into this phase without any other grounding. The five competencies of innovation give us a unique way to look at this big playing field that Edison mastered. The solution-centered mindset, looking at solutions from multiple angles and imagining how they could flow forward into the future. Kaleidoscopic thinking, using whole brain techniques to get the best of the left brain, the best of the right brain engaged in identifying new creative options. Full spectrum engagement, looking and navigating opposites, understanding how to be the most efficient and productive in their workdays. Mastermind collaboration, bringing together multiple disciplines, creating small teams of people that were dynamic and focused on creating new solutions that could impact customers. And finally, Market creation, super value creation, creating products and services that were associated with the needs that people had, things that people were really interested in paying for and generating revenue from. We have a unique innovation heritage in the United States. This is really part of our DNA. And the Edison legacy is a huge part of that. The five competencies of innovation give us a unique lens, a unique view on how Edison became successful. Now, all of you can innovate like Edison. Thank you so much. I know we're going to take some questions and answers now. Um, there are some folks who are watching this remotely. I know that you won't have a chance to uh, call in or text or uh, send an email, but if you would like to ask, ask me a question uh, in the next few days, you're welcome to email me. You can see the address here. I'd be happy to answer your questions. As well, if any of you are on LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook, I would welcome you to reach out and find me. I'd be happy to continue our dialogue that way as well. So let's take a couple of questions. I know that several of you have been sitting there with your notebooks and notepads, so I'm happy to uh, discuss anything that you'd like. There will be a couple of mics, and I know that we've got one here in the center of the room. Yes, please, the young lady here with the purple, uh, or, or I'm sorry, maybe it's black. <laughs> Hi there. Um, Hi. So thousands of people helped Edison, but they didn't get credit. Everything's being called Edison. In our current world, I want to give credit to everybody that makes everything happen. How do we do that? Well, one of the things that was true in Edison's time is that uh, taking patents as an example, only two people could be named on a patent. Otherwise, you would automatically open yourself up to litigation. So there were times when Edison wanted to have multiple people uh, on his patents because there were several that had contributed. So he did put others on his patents in many instances, and they received royalties for that. As well, Edison had uh, profit sharing in his laboratories. So even if people were not able to be on a patent and receive direct royalties, they could share in, in the wealth, if you will, of what had been created in the laboratory. So those were two ways that, that he was able to uh, recognize others 
as much as possible. He also allowed some individuals to patent their own stuff. Uh, this happened uh, in his work with the movies in some instances. Uh, Bakelite actually was patented by engineers in his lab, but he did not appear on that patent. So those were some of the ways that he tried to get around that challenge. Yes, please, a gentleman in the back. Did Edison play a role in education of younger people outside of his uh, immediate associates? Well, one of the challenges... Education and thinking like he did. One of the challenges that was true for Edison was that he, he didn't believe traditional education allowed people to think creatively enough. He experienced challenges in the classroom as a young person. His teachers felt he asked too many questions. So he did hire college graduates, also individuals with uh, master's, master's degrees. He went to schools and, and lectured at schools and worked to inspire young people. Did he directly contribute to the world of education? Other than that, I don't know that he did. He, he wanted people to read, however. He wanted people to be informed about what was going on and to be curious about the world. So those were the themes that he would often hit when he would go out and speak uh, to young people. I think the world of education, though, is something that we need to look at and how we inspire creativity in our young people. Uh, Edison was a kinesthetic learner. He liked to take things apart, put them back together. This is a learning style which is not shared by most people. Some of you in this room may be kinesthetic learners. Typically only about 15% of the population have this learning style. But I think actually more of our young people are, are moving in this direction. I think kinesthetic learning is actually how a lot of young people learn. So we need to do better, I think, in, in bringing some of Edison's own uh, skills in that arena into how we think about education today. Thank you for the question. Did I see a hand over here? Yes, please. Hi, Sarah. Um, can you talk about companies that you really, like co contemporary companies you really admire or leadership groups that are ones that we can identify with now that have characteristics or have successfully transitioned in terms of you've seen them, you know, embrace some of these leadership or innovation characteristics and move towards that? I think the number is smaller than I wish it was. I wish the number was large. Edison's organizations were actually fairly flat. He worked in this team structure that I described. He didn't create what we would know as the traditional industrial age pyramid structure where you have you know, lots of VPs and layers of managers, uh, people overseeing other people. It was more pod-like. So in this flatter environment, I think that we can look to companies like Google. We can look to companies like Netflix, although they've had some stumbles in the last uh, several months. Uh, certainly Apple is a, is a great example of, of this as well. Part of where we're going in terms of company structure is, is creating this flatter environment. So the notions of collaboration that I described a little earlier, I think, will become more important as we move away from the siloed organization and into organizations where information flows more freely on a horizontal basis. Um, but those three are organizations that, that I think do a terrific job. I also just read a fascinating article in the Harvard Business Review as I was flying up here, uh, written by Gary Hamill on Morningstar Farms. I don't know if any of you might have seen it, but very interesting example of this same type of pod-like structure where actually people don't have annual objectives other than the ones that they write for themselves, which is something Edison would love. He would love that people would take the initiative to actually say, here are the things I want to accomplish this year, and here's part of the revenue that I'd like to drive. So really pushing down some of that passion and value creation to the level of the individual employee. I think that's really where we are, we are heading. Um, could you speak a little bit about um, his attitude toward his work and 
the work that he's been creating because there was I remember doing a little bit of research and it was very inspirational to me the way he looked at failure, how it, he didn't see them as failure, he saw them as 10,000 ways it didn't work. And Absolutely. Like a light bulb. Yes. Edison's view of his work was very expansive. You're absolutely correct in his view that failure was just part of the learning process. It was not something that would stop him. A lot of times today, I think we associate failure with what Edison would call dead failure, which is like there's just no other way. I mean, we can't go on from here. In the notebooks that I read of Edison's, I came upon a handful of dead failures. Other than that, there were really just launching pads into the next phase of learning. So Edison's view of experimentation, I think, colored a lot of his work. He would create hypotheses, test something, and see if there was an outcome that met with his hypothesis. If not, then he would create a new hypothesis, or he'd talk to his colleagues, get new input for new hypotheses, and try again. So what Edison was not able to accomplish in terms of fulfilling hypotheses was just as important to him as what he was able to fulfill. In fact, Edison said, if something worked, I was always suspicious. So he actually believed that it was going to take time. He believed that there was going to be a process of trial and error. In terms of other aspects of his work, Edison worked in solitude for portions of every day. This is something I think we also have relatively abandoned. We have so many meetings. We, we are engaged in so many activities. We actually forget how to be creative on our own. What can we do while we're reading? What can we do while we're commuting? What, what can we do in terms of our own notebook writing or journaling that is expansive and powerful? In the second competency of innovation, kaleidoscopic thinking, I talk about notebook writing. This was a big part of Edison's neural network. Uh, what we know to be true about the neural structure of the brain is when we have an insight, there is a bigger burst in the brain than there is when we're reading facts. When we're discovering, the brain lights up differently than if we're just reading standard stuff. So he would write down his inspirations. And that would, in and of itself, lead him to new insights and create patterns around those insights. So he was very consciously expanding his mind every day. And we forget, I think, to do this, you know. So, those are just a few thoughts that I would share about Edison's work style. Um, I think there's, there's so much we can learn about how he conducted himself daily that um, would offer all of us new innovation insights. Thank you. Yes, please. How do you think uh, Edison would approach fixing Americans' broken and fragmented healthcare system? <laughs> How would Edison approach fixing America's broken healthcare system? I actually think what he would advocate is collaboration around this subject. I know Mayo is actually looking at this from a collaborative perspective, and I think that's really where we will achieve results. It isn't necessarily about legislation. It's about how can we get communities uh, and audiences who are engaged in healthcare to have some common dialogue. What is not true of collaboration is polarization. In collaboration, you don't have polar opposites. You can have debate and discussion and disagreement, but you don't have the pulling apart of the discussion. And that's actually what we're experiencing. So Edison would probably advocate certain types of network systems being created across the audiences that are affected by healthcare, and having those audiences uh, engage in constructive debate over a period of time. I think he would want to have multiple minds and multiple perspectives brought to the challenge. I think what he would also advocate is the need for creative solutions, and really looking at a range of solutions, from incremental, all the way out to disruptive. I talked about the solution-centered mindset and opening a large frame of solutions. 
part of what that does is it lets you see how far is far. You know, where are the edges of the conversation? If we just create small discussions and eliminate solutions right away, we never get to the edges or even have a sense of what they are. So I think this is part of our challenge as well. We don't, there's no spectrum. We don't have a, a range of, you know, near, medium, and far in this discussion. And that's really what you need to have, I think, to solve the problem. Yes, please. Uh, Edison needed very few hours of sleep, even from the time he was a child. Only about six hours. So about six, yes. And he sometimes took power naps in the middle of the day. My Aunt Mina would put cots in the lab for him to sleep. Or he'd sleep on his desk sometimes. Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. In fact, I had this conversation today as I was taking my tour with Kevin in April, and, uh, and I also remarked about this particular quote because I think Edison probably only needed 1% inspiration. I think the rest of us need like 10 or 20% inspiration. So really, the 80-20 rule applies. I think you have to have a lot more inspiration to keep things in momentum. This is why that coherence point that I made earlier is so crucial, because 1% isn't going to get you far enough. Yes, please. I was intrigued by how you talked about Edison liking small teams in that they were able to communicate rapidly, um, exchange their ideas. I think with any large organization such as Mayo, um, we experience growing pains. The more people, the more complexity, more disagreements in politics. Um, Mayo has grown far beyond the Mayo brothers and their father. So I'm curious, how do you think Edison handled and adapted to the growth of teams when they became too large to function? I think Edison was very intentional about creating teams and helping determine when they would become large. I don't think that they bloomed out of control without his awareness. He was very mindful of knowing who in his organization were really the, the fulcrum points, the lever points for certain types of conversations. So he used those individuals as sounding boards as they were involved in growing projects. He believed in cross-training. People were cross-trained. Uh, they left the laboratory. They went into a manufacturing facility. I mentioned these 150 plus companies that Edison had. Most of them were manufacturing operations where they were making Edison's inventions. So, you know, leaders in the lab would go and work in the manufacturing operation for a period of time so they could learn what that was all about. Uh, he also had people go into the marketing function and communicate with customers. Uh, he had people become general managers and leaders of new companies. So a lot of times today we, we tend to look at the capabilities of people in, in small ways. I think our capabilities are actually very large. So thinking about small teams, small teams have tremendous capability. I don't think you always have to have large teams. I believe this is what Edison's philosophy espouses. So if you can join teams together, and Edison did this, you want to be sure that you continue to have that inspiration flow, that you have, you know, again, the diverse. Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. I also like to have people who are involved in the initial phase of an invention go all the way through to its commercialization. And this uh, goes back to the first question of how do you recognize people who are involved in an initiative? That's part of how Edison did it, was to keep that initial vision, that initial passion for an idea, and allow them to proceed all the way through the project. This is also not something that often happens as teams get large, is that the original people, the original group, it kind of vaporizes. They don't, they don't have engagement in the, prob in the um, solution process all the way through to market. So I think that's another thing that can be changed. Yes, please. Uh, yes, Sarah. Um, 
So you raised the uh, important uh, organization, Apple, and we, we clearly know that they're going through a lot of transition. Can you provide a little perspective, perhaps a compare and contrast, of Steve Jobs and Thomas Edison? It seems like there are a lot of differences, but just interested in your perspective on two great innovators. Sure, absolutely. I've written a couple of blog posts on this, so you could, if you wanted to Google some of that, you could probably find it online. But this is actually one of my favorite subjects because Steve Jobs is so often likened and was so often likened during his lifetime to Thomas Edison. I think there are two primary commonalities that I see. The first is that they were both inspirational leaders. Within Apple, that had a slightly different effect than it did in Edison's organizations. Steve Jobs inspired his employees to take risks that they wouldn't otherwise have taken. And he inspired... Your conference is now over. Goodbye. Edison did those same things. He inspired his teams of people to look at markets in new ways.